His name, Jesus. I just can't stop singing. I can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name, Jesus. Lift up your voice, sing. Lift up your voice and sing for joy. Clap your hands, make a joyful noise. Blow the trumpet and shout. Praise Him for the victory. The weapons we use are not bomb shakers. So worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. Oh, we will praise Him for the victory. I won't turn. I won't turn back. I won't. I won't turn back. I won't. I won't turn back now. No, I won't turn back. Right now. I won't turn, I won't turn. But it's not too steep The battle is rough But it's not too weak I won't turn back, no I won't turn back The road is hot The road is hot But it's not too long The enemy's here But he's not too strong I won't turn back, no I won't turn back I just can't stop Can't stop Praising his name I just can't stop Praising his name, I just can't stop Praising his name, Jesus No, I just can't stop no. I can't stop Praising his name, no, I just can't stop Praising his name, I just can't stop Praising his name, Jesus Come and do it one more time, lift your voice Lift up your voice and sing for joy Clap your hands, make a joyful noise Blow the trumpet and shout Praise Him for the victory. The weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. Praise Him for the victory. I just can't stop. I can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name. Jesus. I just can't stop praising. Can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, Jesus. I won't turn back, sing it. I won't turn back. Somebody now. sing it. I won't, I won't turn, turn back. back. No, I won't. I won't. I won't turn back now. I won't turn back. I won't. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I won't turn back now. Somebody needs to say this in faith. Well, lift up your voice and sing for joy. Your hands make a joyful noise. Blow the trumpet and shout. Praise Him for the victory. The weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. Praise Him for the victory. I just can't stop. I can't stop. Praising His name, I just can't stop. Praising His name, I just can't stop. 
Come on, somebody, and praise him right now. Hallelujah. Somebody lift him up. Hallelujah. This is the way we fight. Oh, this is how we overcome. Oh, this is how we get the victory. This is how you overcome the devil. This is how you overcome sin. Oh, you got to lift up your voice. Oh, sing for joy. Clap your hands. Make a joyful noise. Oh, Jesus, we claim victory, Lord. Oh, oh, somebody lift your voice and give the Lord praise in this place tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Look at somebody around you and say, it feels like Sunday night, church. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you so much for being here on this Sunday night. And I'm going to invite us to stand together tonight. And if you're praying, I'm not going to stop you from praying. I do feel a very urgent word from the Lord on this Sunday night. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to mention uh, it's good to see uh, Betty Tucker able to be back with us tonight. Also, uh, Michael Green able to be back with us this evening. And uh, surprise, uh, Amos had told me he wasn't going to be able to be here tonight. And then I was sitting there playing drums. I thought, there's somebody in his spot. And then I started looking, and it ain't somebody in his spot. It was him. So it's good to see him tonight. Praise God. Tell you what, it's just, yeah, yeah. He, was, he thought he was going to have to be all the way in Jackson tonight. And so, uh, well, there you go. There you go. Oh, my. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Doesn't it feel good to be in church? I'm telling you, it's great. To be enjoying the presence of the Lord. Genesis chapter 21. I'll be reading from King James Version tonight. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up, the Bible says, early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Now I think that's really interesting to look at. God really didn't tell him anywhere. But he had to just keep following the voice of God. Here's where I want you to turn. Here's where I want you to go. But we know he made it to the place that God told him to go. The Bible says, Then on the third day Abram lifts up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He lays it upon Isaac his son. Now notice that again, I told you there's, there's a lot of symbolisms here of Calvary and Jesus Christ in this story. What does he have the young man carry? The wood. What did Jesus carry? All right. So there's a lot of symbolisms here, and I'm going to try not to get caught off in those weeds because I really like to preach that stuff, but that's not what I'm here to preach tonight. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abram his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, your son. And he said, Behold the father in the wood, or behold the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Look at verse 9. And they came to the place. Which God had told him of. Where is that? Well, it's not important at this point. Abraham builds an altar there. He lays the wood in order. He binds Isaac, his son. He lays him on the altar upon the wood. Now, I have to believe that if there would have been a struggle, it would have been recorded. All right? 
You find where there's other struggles in Scripture, we find it recorded. I don't believe there was a struggle. I believe that he, he was basically submissive to his father. And Abraham, the Bible says, stretches forth his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But thank God for verse 11. The angel of the Lord calls unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Can somebody say amen? So my subject tonight, it's going to seem off the wall at first, but hopefully we'll get there. It's, it's just simply this. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Let's pray while we're standing. Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of being able to call upon your name. We've sang about that name, and we know that you hear us. We feel your presence in this room. Bless us, Lord, tonight as we break the bread of life, I pray, God. Let it be multiplied, just like we prayed for our offering to be multiplied, oh God, that, Lord, we will have, ex we will have excess, like the story of the two fish and the five loaves, that when we leave, we've got something to take with us and share with somebody else. Let goodness and mercy overtake us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Somebody shout, in Jesus' name. Name. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now, I've been in church all my life, and when I say that, I got the Holy Ghost, age six, uh, pretty close to being seven when I got the Holy Ghost. And uh, if you were to name a hymn, I could probably get pretty close to telling you the page number that it used to be in, in the old Sing Unto the Lord hymnal books. You know, if you, it was funny, we used to be able to play that game. We would be going down the road, us church kids, and we would call out, you know, a song and then name the page number because we had heard it so many times. I don't know uh, many of you, I know there's quite a few in this room that remember Brother White when he would lead worship and lead singing and he would say, let's turn to page number and sing and then give us the title of the song. And so I've been in church most of my life and, and so I, I, I've seen a lot of things, Brother AC, come and go. And there's all kinds of people who come and worship God in many different ways. I say that to say this. There are two different kinds of believers. There's the kind that go to church for the beauty and the aroma and the atmosphere and the liturgical order of service. They don't necessarily feel like when they talk to God that He really hears or that He intervenes. But they get some kind of a sanctity from just going to church. I don't get it. But the atmosphere takes control of the experience. And so they come in and, and they, they some people go to a certain church because they got a certain kind of organ or whatever you know they pray and they talk to God but they don't really believe or think that God intervenes in their affairs and they just see him as some sovereign power and they come to God like some who go to therapists where they lay down on the couch and they get the benefit of the experience of just releasing how they feel and that can actually make you feel pretty good you ever just needed somebody to talk to Somebody gave you a lending ear. You walked out of there feeling better. Now, I can't necessarily say that about them, but you walked out of there feeling a whole lot better, you know. And there is an experience with that where you're just able to release how you feel. And so they get a little bit of joy out of going to church because they come to church and they just tell the Lord how they feel and what they've been through. These kinds of people don't necessarily think that God would open his mouth, clear his throat, and actually speak. They do all the talking. They have a monologue, if you will, with God. They do all the talking, and their God does all the listening. And God forbid he ever interrupted them. You know, it's a one-way conversation. On the other extreme, there's folks that I run into in my life, and I'm telling you, God just talks to them all the time. He tells them where to park, where to go, where they were going to run into you that day. They got a word for you. They got a word for everything. I know you don't know anybody like that, but I do. And God just talks, 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 and all the time. I believe that somewhere between the extreme silence of one parameter and the beautiful ongoing vernacular that just seems to spew out of the mouth of some, somewhere in the middle is really the truth where there is a balance that God talks to us today. And I'm going to tell you tonight, we must talk about it. Because it is not so important what we say to God as it is what God says to us. 
See, we spend a whole lot of time talking about speaking to God and speaking in all kinds of ways. But let me tell you something that most people who have a speaking problem, generally they have a speaking problem because they have a hearing problem. You ever met somebody that they couldn't really talk too plain? Well, then you come to find out that they were probably having some hearing issues as a young child and that messed up their speech. If you can't hear right, you can't speak right. Maybe we ought not focus so much on what we have to say to God and actually should be focusing more on what does God have to say to me? I promise you, I'm going to go somewhere tonight and we're going to preach probably for about 10 minutes when I get there. But after all, I I want you to understand this. The book of Revelations, Brother Seton, it doesn't say he that has a mouth, let him speak. He doesn't... You know, basically what this passage is talking about is he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. But we've had no practice learning how to hear from God. We don't know exactly what to expect. What does his voice sound like? Has he got this some big bass voice like the fictitious movies would project? What does God sound like? And so we're listening for something, but we don't actually know what it is. So that brings struggle. The book of Hebrews says that we have another set of senses that have not been exercised. I'm not talking about our ears, our mouth, our tongue. We've got a whole other set of senses that the Bible says is only exercised by reason of use. And the Bible talks about having an inner ear. As a matter of fact, it calls it the circumcised ear in the scripture. It's not the ear that you're hearing this sermon with right now. It is the ear of the soul. It is what Elijah called the still small voice. It is the kind of feeling, the unction, my friend Pastor Emery would call it, a whatchamacallit, or some of you have heard heard it called here in the south, called a thingamajig. Anybody ever heard of that? And and what we're talking about is sometimes, you know, we got to be careful, uh, or or something that, that says be quiet on the inside of us. That's the inner voice that is speaking. Sometimes I think there's so much noise around us that we cannot hear God. And how can we walk with a God That we cannot hear. We must. Hear me tonight. We must hear from God. For he is our navigational system. I promise you I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. He directs us. For the Amos it doesn't matter. I've been through Nashville so many times. I, I wouldn't try this but I probably could drive it in my sleep. I've been through Memphis a whole bunch of times. I, I know those roads. My wife still laughs at me because every time I go through Memphis and Nashville, sometimes if I'm just going across Jackson, I want to know what time I'm going to get there. And if I'm going to be late, I feel the courtesy that I need to call the person and tell them I'm not going to be on time. I like using a GPS. That's the way that, the same way that a GPS operates in your vehicle, that's the same way that God wants to operate in our lives. And what I love about my my GPS or my phone that I'm using now that will talk through my vehicle is when I do something dumb and I make a wrong turn, it recalculates and it says, turn around or make a U-turn and go back. Now I know they've got different voices now that talk and thankfully I hadn't found one that says, you big dummy, you just missed your turn, you know. But this one still says, recalculating. Turn around and go back. Sometimes we need God to tell us we've made a wrong turn. I don't know about you, but this pastor has made mistakes at one time or two. And I have to have the voice of God to help me to get back on track and to go where we need to go. But how can he talk to us when the first thing we do is we grab the telephone and we start calling all kinds of people and telling them what we're going through and what's happening in our lives and what's going on with our children and what's going on in our marriage and we're watching TV and we're listening to that music and we got all kinds of stuff going on and even, let me just put it this way, even people singing about God and talking about God and preaching about God and all the while God's saying if you'll cut all that stuff off for a moment, I will want to talk to you. I want to show you how to get through this season in your life. I want to encourage somebody tonight. This moment in your destiny needs the voice of God. This present danger that you face. He says I can navigate you through it. You don't have to lose your mind. You don't have to backslide because of the problem. If you can just hear what the Spirit is saying unto you. 
you wouldn't fear anybody. You wouldn't fear any affliction. You wouldn't fear any circumstance. After all, if God be for you, who? Oh, somebody try that with me. Somebody shout, who? You've got to have that kind of bold faith that when the enemy comes up against you, you look at him and say, who? In other words, it doesn't matter who you think you are. I know who I am, and I know the kind of God that I serve, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If God before you, who can be against you? So, let's go back to our text. I don't want you to get nervous. Since Abraham, he's God's friend, right? Everybody remember that? He called the friend of God. He, God now invites him into an experience. As I told you in my text, there is so much in Genesis 22 I could say and I'd like to say, but I can get caught off in those weeds and not say what the Lord wants me to say tonight. It is a reflection of the Christ going to Calvary, an Old Testament foreshadowing of Calvary's deliverance. It happens in the same ridge of mountains, and it's full of metaphors that point us to the bloody side of the Savior. I'm going to do my best to avoid them tonight. Uh, but for God, I pointed it out in my, in my text, Abraham, he says, he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, and take him to a mountain that I will tell thee of. Now, this is a problem that I have with God. You ready? I'm a person that likes detail. My wife knows that, all right? If she says, go get my purse, I'm going to stand there and look at it. Where? And if she says the car, okay, is it the front seat? The back seat? Because I'm not in, I don't really enjoy scavenger hunts for stuff like that. I want to know details. But you know what? Here's this problem that I have with God. He don't always give me the details. Now, if you're going to give me directions, and I know I'm in West Tennessee tonight, but please don't give me them country directions that say, you know, go down yonder a piece, and when you get down there, you're going to go over the meadow, and you're going to come to Cooter Holler. And I don't know what Cooter Holler is. I don't live there, you know. You turn left when you see the old oak tree that, you know, Mary and Jim, they got their name carved in the side of it. And I don't like that kind of stuff. I want specific directions. You're going to go through three red lights. When you get to the fourth, turn left. And you're going to pass Dairy Queen. I'll probably stop right there. But, and then you go five more blocks and make a right. Just give it to me straight. But the problem with God is that God is not always in the business of giving you all the detail. He doesn't give you sometimes. He doesn't even give you anything to go by. Because after all, it's in His Word that says we are to walk by faith and not and see, if you have too many facts, you might not have enough faith. If you knew everything that you were going to face tomorrow, you might not want to get out of bed. You might not even have the faith enough to get up and put your shoes on in the morning. But if you have too many facts, it can mess with your faith. I'm slowing down on purpose tonight because there's some things we need to understand. And so God says to this man, he says, who we've been waiting for all of your life. You're having this child. You finally got it. And God says, take him to a place somewhere over yonder. And you're not even going to know when you get there. I'll tell you when you get there. You'll know it then. But, and, and then I'm going to tell you what to do with him. Yeah, I don't like that. You know, Being a man and a husband, it's kind of hard to come home. Sometimes because you know. Oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Because you know you women are a little more into details than we are. Now I just told you, Sister Ross, I like details. But y'all are the people that come home from work, huh? And you got all this information. You know, hon, the traffic was terrible. And I had to stop by Walmart. You know, I ran into Helen at Walmart. And you know Helen, she's the one whose mama's sick. And I had to go get some green beans. And Helen kept me there for 25 minutes. I didn't ask you that. I just want to know what was for dinner, you know. <laughs> oh, my. Can you imagine Mr. Abraham going home? That's a conversation I would not want to have. Honey, you know that baby that you've wanted all your life to have? And you know you waited all them years even after the promise. And that baby finally was delivered. You know, you didn't even get pregnant until your knees were wrinkled in. You finally had this baby. 
I need to take him with me. Where are you going? <laughs> Somewhere. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm going to offer him as a burnt offering. No, honey, I'm not crazy. <laughs> I'm going to offer him as a burnt offering. That would have to be a hard sell. And the least God could do is give you a few details to, to at least tell his mama. But anytime God wants you to do something important for him, he doesn't give you all the details. Because now watch this. God will use not only the destination, but he will use the journey to train you in how to hear the voice of God. I think we pray wrong sometimes. We're always praying about what we're try- where we're trying to go. But really the experience with God is not all, not all about where you're trying to go. It's what you're needing to learn while you're trying to get there. Can I get a witness tonight? I wouldn't take anything for things that I have learned on this journey. God says, take now thy son, thine only son. He said, take him to a place I'm going to tell you about. He's using the test to train Abraham's ear to hear the voice of God under pressure. God may be using your test to train your ear to hear his voice in times of stress. And you say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. Lord, I don't know how long we're going to stay when we get there. And Lord, he's just saying, walk with me. Walk with me. I got some things I want to teach you along the way. Just walk. I've ordered your steps. I've determined your way. And when you get there, the provision's going to be made for you to take the next step. And when you get there, I'm going to have the provision for you to take the next step. Oh, somebody stomp your foot. Come on, somebody stomp your foot. The Lord brought you here tonight to show you there's another step. There's another step for you to take. Come on, our God may not be big on the details, but he's big on bringing you through the process. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. If you've got the courage to take another step, God's going to go with you. Oh, somebody give him praise in this house right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So Abraham's leading. He's got his son with him. Got his servants with him. I'm gonna step out of the King James because you know I got kids in the room. He's got the donkeys with him, and he's got all this stuff. Now listen to me. I have to believe he's had all this stuff. He had y'all. He, he's been traveling for how many days? In one point of the scripture says three days in, he sees the place afar off. So I'm pretty sure they've got food. That sort of thing. Because if you go home and you tell your wife, I'm taking your promise and we're going somewhere and we don't know where we're going, I know what happens when I'm just going to the campground and she knows where I'm going. I got a duffel bag full of snacks I can't hardly lift into the van, Brother White. My God, she's worried we're going to starve in the 180-something miles, 80-something miles, not even 100 miles that we're going to get there, you know. And so we're going to have a bag of snacks. We go on vacation. I mean, my goodness, it don't matter where we're going, what we're doing. It could be an all-inclusive Disney vacation, but we're going to have snacks, you know. So I got to believe it. <laughs> Step off my soapbox, okay. <laughs> I got to believe that Mama's put some snacks in there. Maybe ham sandwiches and peanut butter and a couple Happy Meals. Come on. Because she, she don't know how long they're going to be gone. You know. And uh, they're following him and saying, well, wait. Before I go there. There is nothing harder than leading people who are asking you questions that you don't have the answer to. The best message of Because of the Times was the ode to the apostolic church, in my opinion. When he said, I sit in my desk, and I'm still trying to get a copy of it so I can show you guys this message. It is a powerful message. And he talks about how that there are times where you will sit behind a pastor's desk and be asked questions that you can't answer. I was asked this morning, how can God let somebody be stabbed 60 times? And this was something that somebody this morning was walking through because they saw that with their own eyes. Brother White, I couldn't give them answers on everything all I can tell them is you know God's faithful to us 
And when you start going through those hard times and those kind of things, the Lord will bring you through it. And you have to just pray through those times. That sounds so insufficient when you hear about the horror that they just walked through. But there's times where as a leader, you don't have all the answers. And it's just great pressure on you to have a plan. We go to all these preachers' conferences and they say, you need a 10-year strategy? And then we're going to do this in two years and we're going to fix this and we're going to fix that. People have all these plans. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. If you want to be a comedian, go home tonight and get down on your knees and tell God all your plans that you've got planned and watch him laugh. Because he's going to stir it up. Because God doesn't really care what your plan is. See, he didn't settle the world on what I had planned. See, he had to kind of set Job in place. Where were you when I threw the stars into space? Hold on, Joker. Before you get too all high and mighty about what your life's going, where were, where, who do you think you are? He said he didn't cause the world to spin on what I had planned. He didn't cause the galaxies to operate around what I think. God had a strategy before he laid the foundation of the world forever and ever. His word is settled in heaven. God already had the end determined before the first step was ever made. Before the sin was ever committed, there was a lamb that was slain. Come on, you're discovering what God's able to do. But God is not discovering what he's able to do. There's even one point in scripture he asked him. He's, it's the, the five loaves, two fish. He says, he said, what are we going to do? The Bible even turns around and says, he knew what he would do. He was standing there wringing his hands. How are we going to feed all these people? He knew what he was going to do. And I'm not trying to be insensitive tonight. I know your problems are big, bad, and ugly. But God's not wringing his hand saying, what am I going to do? He knows what he can do. He knew he was able before there was anybody that ever told him, God, you're able. He knew he was a healer before that doctor ever walked in the room and gave you your diagnosis. He knew he was a provider. Before the first problem ever stuck its ugly head up, he was God all by himself. I want you thankful you serve a powerful God today. Praise God. So it was asked of Abraham, where are you going? <laughs> well, I don't exactly know. Now, wouldn't that be a hard staff meeting? <laughs> I don't know exactly where we're going because he's teaching me to listen. And he said... He would tell me while I walk. And that's what I came to tell you tonight, that God will tell you while you walk. See, you've been praying and asking God for details. And God says, just start walking. And while you're walking with me, I'm going to fill you in on what's next. And so I want you to walk with your feet and listen with your heart. And before you take the next step, I'll give the next command. And when you need to do something else, I'll give you the next command. And until I tell you something else to do, you do what I told you before. I get it. I get it. We sometimes don't like what God says to do. And so he tells us to do something, and we do it one time, and we say, okay, God, next? Then you ain't learned it yet. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again until we learn the point of the process. And when I want to tell you to turn, you see, my navigational system doesn't speak anymore until it's time to take the next turn. Once I turn on, if I'm just going to the campground and I've got about 60 something miles on I 40, basically what it says on my GPS screen is it'll say 60 something miles till you'll turn right and take exit 172, you know. And, and it'll start talking. It won't talk until I get to the place where I'm supposed to turn off. Now, sometimes I'd like for it to say something cool like, you're doing good. <laughs> Keep going. Come on down the road, you know. Put the pedal to the metal. It don't ever tell me that. <laughs> Let it rip. Sometimes God doesn't say anything until it's time to make the next move. The question is, can you endure the silence of walking out your faith while God's not speaking to your insecurities? Sometimes God says nothing at the moments of tremendous insecurity. 
Can I say this tonight and you understand what I'm saying? God doesn't talk to make you feel good. He speaks to tell you what next point you're supposed to make. And Abram's walking. And he's leading. And he's got responsibilities. And he's got all this pressure. And he's uncertain. And God says, this is the gym that I put you in to exercise your ability to hear the inner ear. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. It's not air conditioned. It's not designed to be cut to the exact structure of your vulnerabilities or insecurities. God's saying, I mean for you to be uncertain. You hear that? I mean for your heart to be beating fast right now. I mean for you to have to trust me. I mean to take you out to where your friends can't help you and where your support systems are not in place. I'll move you away from your backup and your boys and your friends because I want you to have an experience with me and your circle of friends are screaming too loud. I want you to get to a place where you can hear my voice. My God, he said, I've got to have you by yourself. I've been waiting 10 years to get you by yourself. And now I want to show you that it was me that took care of you all the way. It was me that blessed you. It was me that provided for you. It was me that took care of you. It was me all the time. I'm trying to hurry tonight. He's trying to figure out where he's going. Where are we going? Where are we going? Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. You ever had a kid in the car? Are we there yet? <laughs> Finally, we bought Matthew a shirt that says it. Are we there yet? <laughs> the Bible said when he was yet three days off, he looked up and he saw the place afar off. He said, that's it right there. How do you know? I don't know, but I know. Or we would say it down here. I know it with my knower. But I don't know how my knower knows. But my knower knows. But man, that's the right place right there. Let me put it more where you can understand what I'm saying. You ever been in that place? And it finally came to me. That is the woman I'm supposed to marry. Or that is the job I'm supposed to have. That's the career move that I'm supposed to make. That's the place I'm supposed to build that house. That's the place I'm supposed to go. I don't know how to tell you that I know it, but somehow in my spirit. See, this is what I'm talking about. The Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. There are sons and daughters in this house tonight. And just because God didn't wake you up this morning and boom down from heaven and say something to you, God will still talk to you and you will still hear his voice when it's time for you to make the next move. Quit questioning, am I still a child of God because I ain't heard your voice today. He said, my sheep are going to know my voice and they're going to follow me. I feel the Holy Ghost in this building right now. Don't feel like you're backslid just because you didn't hear from him talking to you this morning. Let his word speak on a daily basis. Let his word talk on a daily basis and give you direction. But when you need a direct word from God, he's going to give it to you. Women do this all the time. I'm not just picking on you now, but I'm telling you, y'all have got it figured out. You go shopping, you go in the mall, you go in that store, and the sales clerk comes up and says, can I help you? And you tell her politely because you're a Christian. I'm just looking. That politely means go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> she don't get it, does she? Now all she says, you know, what size do you wear? You want to say none of your business, but you don't. <laughs> but again, because you're Christian and you're polite, you say, I told you, I'm, I'm just looking. Well, we just got this that just came in. What are you looking for? And you say, I don't know, but I'll know it. It's the same way in the spiritual. I'll know it. Y'all going to play with me. I better move on. You didn't know how you knew, but you told that daughter that boyfriend wasn't right. I may not be able to tell you, honey, who is the one, but I can tell you this ain't the one. Come on. You can't prove it. 
You can't explain it. You don't have anything against the boy. But you just know this ain't it. Are you hearing me tonight? I'm just kind of giving an explanation as to how this stuff happens. That's the way God wants to speak to you in your spirit. And he'll set up calamities. Check this out. He sets up calamities as opportunities to train you in the gymnasium of developing your inner ear to hear him in the crisis. Your crisis is just a test. It's not a real problem. It's not just a huge issue. It's a gym. It's a training center. It's a workout room. And you think the problem is a problem? No. God just gave you a problem so you'll learn to trust him in the dark moments of your life. So you'll learn to recognize his voice. My God. I know I'm talking to somebody right now. I don't know who you are, but the Lord is helping us tonight. He was still a great ways off from it, but he knew he was coming up on it. And the closer he got to his destiny, the more he had to release his history. So he says to the servants, stay here with the donkeys. Me and the lad are going to go yonder to worship. There are some people that will only be able to go so far in your life. No matter how much you love them, no matter how much you care about them, no matter how much you think of them, no matter what they've done for you in the past, no matter how they paid your rent when you were back in college, that kind of loyalty is dangerous. There comes a point in walking with God that you have to choose whether you're going to walk with Him or keep company with some of your friends. And frankly, there's some folks you need to say, See ya. Because they're going to do nothing but keep you from the destiny God has for your life. Abraham told his servants, stay with the donkeys. If you're writing anything down, write this. Dedication requires separation. You cannot have dedication without separation. And if your faith doesn't bring you to a place of separation, your life will never become a place of dedication. He says, now this is the point where I leave you behind me and me and the lad are going yonder to worship. Now he's talking to his son. You see, the closer you are getting to God's will, the smaller the crowd around you can become. The closer you get to your destiny, the smaller the crowd becomes. And God called Abraham alone. Jacob was left alone with God. Paul wrote the epistles from a jail cell. Stop fighting being alone. Because God will whisper to you when you're alone. And he'll talk to you when you're in the cave. And he'll speak to you when you're by yourself. But there will come a point where he'll call you back out. And you got to go right back among the people again. And down to just him and the kid and the boys looking at him saying, Hey, Daddy. Excuse me. I notice you got that big old dagger hanging off your side. And I'm carrying all this wood. And we've taken this trip a few times. Now, maybe not here, but we have went some different places before. We normally, we got a sacrifice. Uh, excuse me. Did you forget something? Did you forget the lamb? Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God himself shall provide the sacrifice. In other words, I've come so far by faith now that I can't worry about the provision when destiny is calling me. I'm willing to walk into it as I go and trust him that when I need it, he's going to provide it. And so Abraham and the lad went to the mountain together and he lays down the wood. And this, this, this is a burnt offering. Y'all ever studied out what burnt offerings? They were not pretty. Nasty. They tied the animal down, hand and foot, above his pile of wood. Animal would get killed and the blood would be caught in a pan. I don't do blood. That just kind of. Then beyond that, you ever been somewhere and you smelt just something burning and it didn't smell right? The flesh of this animal would burn. Can you imagine the smell? So here's Abraham. He's tied his son, his only son. To this altar. Behold, he goeth like a lamb led to the shearers. He says not a mumbling word, becoming obedient unto death. I, again, I just throw this out here for food for thought tonight. Josephus, the historian, says he, he believes Isaac wasn't a kid. He believes he was a grown man. Now, again, I don't know this, but it would kind of draw symbolism of um, he, he 
was big enough to fight his dad and didn't. No matter how old the boy was, I don't believe there was a struggle, like I said in my text. I believe he was submissive. Here's this son. He's tied down to the altar. Abraham has raised his knife to slay his only son. Abraham is walking in what God told him to do. But that GPS is getting real close to the next turn. It's important, Abraham, that you don't tune out just because you're in a situation now. He raises the knife to slay his son because he's operating in past revelation. The problem in the church today is when we get one word from God, we think that lasts our lifetime. If Abraham would have felt that way, he'd have killed a kid that God never intended for him to kill. It's not that God didn't tell him to do it. But what does the word say? Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word. That means I must continue to listen to the voice of God. We have got to just quit saying some things because we've heard. We must get ourselves into a prayer room and receive a right now word from God. I'm not talking about doctrine. That's forever settled. But I'm talking about where God's telling us and what we need to be doing in our lives. That sometimes will change. Yesterday's sacrifices don't bring about today's success. Moses, just because God told you to smite the rock the first time doesn't mean that's what you do the second time. You need to hear the now word. And I'm going to tell you something. If we don't get a now word from God, we'll kill our future. So he raises the knife. I'm almost done. And he, he's about to slay his son. And a voice comes from out of heaven that says, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Oh, if Abraham couldn't hear, he would have killed his own child because he could not hear the preceding word of God. Don't kill your dreams because you've gone deaf to his voice. Raises his hand to slay his son. And God peels back to heaven and says, stop right there. All of this is just a test. I never wanted your son's blood. I'm actually going to come and I'm going to robe myself in flesh. You see, your son's blood is going to be impure. It's going to be imperfect. It's not going to redeem the world. But I'm going to robe myself in flesh and become a son. And my blood's going to be able to do it. So why did you take me through all this? When you didn't even want what you asked me for. He says, don't panic. It's just a test. You see, you think what you're going through tonight is about what you're going through. I'm here to tell you it's absolutely not. You think the problem you're facing is the issue. It's absolutely not. This is the exercise equipment that God is using to strengthen your ability to hear his voice. For it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Something's going to happen in this house tonight. You see, just when you have run out of ideas and you've run out of friends to call and you've run out of help to receive, always know that is a sign that something is about to happen. Tell your neighbor, say, something's about to happen. Come on, look at somebody around you and tell them, say, something's about to happen. And so he stretches back his arm and he pulls his knife and God says, stop it right there. Everything that I took you through is just a test. I don't want your son. I want your ear. I want to know, can I interrupt you and you listen? I want to know, can I change your direction and you really change? I want to know that can I get in your business and in your plans? I want to know that if I take you through something, are you sensitive to every word that comes out of my mouth? And he says, if you obey me, I'll show you. Look behind you. There is a ram that is tied up in the thicket. I've got to stop, but I need to tell you one more thing. If you study rams, you'll find out rams don't like heights. They don't want to climb mountains. It's against their nature to go that high on the mountain mountain but while Abraham's coming up one side the provision is coming up on the other I'm here to tell somebody when you get to where God says you need to be there your provision's going to be waiting on you it'll be there when you get there the opportunity will be there when you get there you just got to keep walking by faith because on the other side of the mountain God has a blessing that's going to meet you 
I want every one of you that has a problem, has a need, has a child, has a circumstance that's under attack right now, I want you to understand that while you're going up one side, the answer's coming up. God sent this pastor tonight with a simple word. Look over your shoulder. Look over your shoulder. Somewhere between now and then, God is going to speak to you and change your direction and change your perspective. And when you get in that place of his next voice, just look over your shoulder. Everything you need to do, what he called you to do, is going to be there when you need it to be there. I'm going to close. I'm going to stop. Brother Cannon, come back to music. We've got to learn to hear the voice of God even when we're under pressure. If it's permissible, join the hands with somebody next to you right now. Please, everyone, don't leave somebody by themselves right now. The Spirit of the Lord's in this house. Abraham was walking with God. God is walking with Abraham, and he's saying, Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Is the reception clear? Can you hear me? You were shocked by what happened, but I was not. That's what God's saying. Can you hear me? I have the answer before you have the question. I never wanted you to suffer. I never wanted you to cry. I never wanted you to worry. I never wanted you to get upset and lose your way. I just wanted you to listen. God's telling somebody in this building tonight, I love you too much to leave you alone. I don't know who this is tonight I'm preaching to, but the Lord's saying, I've got you covered. I'm just training you to trust me. I have you covered. I'm training you to hear my voice. I've got you covered. Your husband may not be listening. Your wife may not be listening. The kids may not be listening. God said, I'm listening, but can you hear me? Would you close your eyes with me right now? Will you listen low? Will you listen high? Will you listen when you're broke? Will you listen when you got a little money in your pocket? Well, All of this stuff you're going through is just exercise equipment. What he really wants to know is can you hear him? I believe the hand of the person you're holding right now in some area of their life, they need to hear from God. And I don't know how we're going to close this tonight. We may not even have singers for a little while. But I believe that God is here right now. I've on purpose brought this down a moment. You're fine. Keep playing. Because I believe that if we turn down all the noise of the he said, she said, they said, and what about this and what about that? He says, if you'll just turn down that noise, I've got a little thing to tell you that there's a ram that's over your shoulder. I've already got it worked out. This is a controlled test in a controlled laboratory environment. I've never let it get out of control. You believe that God's ever let your life get so far out of control he wasn't in control of it? No. He's saying, I've hedged you in. I've wrapped you around. You're safe. The angels have been dispatched to you. I believe the Spirit of God's moving in this house today. And He's going to bless the person that you're touching hands with right now. He's ministering to that person even right now as I speak. Would you lift your voice and let's talk to the Lord. God's saying, can you hear me? Because if you can hear me, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. I'm going to pour you out a blessing you won't even have room enough to receive. Would you pray for that neighbor right now? You don't have to know what they're going through. You don't have to know the situation. Father, we thank you tonight for the sacrifice that you gave us on Calvary, God. We thank you for the test that we go through and the trials that we face. That's a mouthful, but God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you're training us. I I will never look at my problem the same way. They're they're, they're nothing but barbells and training equipment, oh God. I, I don't want to lose the ability to hear your voice. Show me where the rams are. Lord God, as I close tonight, search the building, I pray. Let it find, oh God, whoever it is that needs this message and let it change them. I'm praying right now, God, that you would heal us in this room today emotionally. God, that you would bless us, that you would strengthen us in this room. Search this place, oh God. Would you pray that right now? Search this place, oh God. Find every backslider. Find every sinner. Find every person that needs to know you. Find everybody who's been in the car by themselves, driving along and not realizing they thought they were by themselves and making wrong turns. But you've been there all along. You've been trying to get them to turn their life around. Find them tonight, oh God, and let them hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. Would you stand with me right now?
I believe that person that you've been praying with. I want both of you just to lift your hands to the Lord right now. We're going to just sing a little bit of worship. Brother Cannon, if you'll do it by yourself. I believe, I want to keep praise singers in the pew right now. But we're just going to sing a little bit of worship to the Lord. And we're going to entertain His presence. I believe God's going to lead us in what to do next. I don't have an official closing right now. I'm practicing what I'm preaching. I don't know what to do next, but I believe the Spirit's going to speak to us in this room. I believe the Holy Ghost is going to minister in this house. Let's worship together just a moment. Would you lift your hands? Jesus, we love you. You're all. Would you sing that with us tonight? Say, you're all. You're all I ever Yes, Jesus. Would you declare that? You're all. You're in this room right now, Jesus. Help me know you. Yes, Lord. Oh, let's sing it together. You're all. You're all I want. Oh, yes, Jesus. You're all I ever needed. a sign of surrender when we say God I'm laying everything else aside and I'm going after you I'm reaching for you God because you're everything that I need oh, help me know let's sing it one more time in this house say Lord you're all I want Here's what I feel the Holy Ghost telling us to do tonight. Where you're standing is symbolizing the place where Abraham, his son, and all those folks were standing when he says, me and the lad will go yonder to worship. I'm going to ask us tonight that as Brother Cannon would lead us again in song, I'm going to ask for you to step out from where you are. We're going to go a step further tonight. And we're going to say, I'm going to find the ram. I'm not just going to worship, but I'm believing that when I get to where he tells me to be, that God's going to have that direction waiting for me. Would you step out from where you are tonight? Let's find ourselves a place to worship Him. I believe that in this house, we're saying, I'm going to find the ram. That when we leave in a time of worship, in that moment of worship, God will show us the